My first year teaching STEM, I was the most nervous about behavior management. As a former classroom teacher of about 25-ish kids, I was now going to be teaching six different classes a day, which averaged to about 150 kids. That is a huge change. Through my years in elementary STEM, I have found what works best with behavior management. Yes, you are a specials teacher, but this is still extremely important, especially when you see that many kids in one day. In today's episode, I will be sharing with you my top STEM teacher behavior management strategies. Before stepping into the STEM space, I was a classroom teacher for six years, and behavior management was a huge asset of mine and something that was really important to me. I knew that if I had a strong climate and culture in my classroom, strong systems and routines, and behavior management strategies, I knew that the kids and I could do anything all year long. It really had to come down to setting up those structures at the beginning of the year and being consistent all the way through. That is the same for your role as a STEM teacher. Just because you are in the special space doesn't mean that you can put behavior management to the side. In fact, you know, if you are also coming from the classroom, how important this is. You don't want to be sitting in your classroom as a classroom teacher and get a phone call from specials that someone in your class isn't doing what they're supposed to do. And as a specials teacher, you really shouldn't be doing that. You should be communicating with classroom teachers, but it's your role to have control of the classroom while still creating a meaningful and engaging experience for your students. So here are my big three top tips for getting started in your classroom. You definitely are going to find what works best with your management style and the kids that you teach. But if you are consistent and have these routines, you're definitely going to have a more successful time with all of the future lessons that you teach. You probably already know what I'm going to say for this first one, but first of all, you need to build those relationships with kids. It doesn't matter where you teach, relationships are the biggest thing that you need to focus on. This is something that is reiterated all the time in the book, The Innovator's Mindset by George C. I don't know how to say his last name, so I'm not going to try. So sorry, George, if you're listening, but this is an excellent book. I highly recommend you reading that or listening to the audio version like I did. And he really emphasizes about building those relationships. And I completely agree. That's probably the big reason why you got into teaching anyway, when it comes down to it, really build those relationships with kids. Now, it is a bit different since you're not a homeroom teacher per se, but there's a lot of creative ways that you can do this. Now, it is pretty cool when you are a specials teacher and you do see the kids year after year because you see that growth in kids. So you have that special bond that a classroom teacher might not have unless they loop with their kids. So the first thing is really engage with kids when you have those other outside duties, whether it's door duty, bus duty, crosswalk, really engage with those kids and get to know them. You probably will see the same kids at the same time of the day. So really build those relationships outside of your STEM space. That is such a great way to interact with a lot of kids at once. Another big thing when you're ready to work up to that is after school clubs. I've always been obsessed about after-school clubs also as a classroom teacher because this, again, was another great way to build relationships with kids and work on passions that they enjoy and passions that I like as well. So we had a common interest. Having after-school clubs is an awesome way to engage with kids and try new things and do things that are, yes, engaging, but not always academic. Now, we will be talking about after-school clubs in future episodes, but Just keep that in mind. After school clubs are a great way to engage with kids. Another fun way that I like to build relationships with my students in my classroom is STEM style. In episode four in STEM Survival Camp, I mentioned STEM style, and this is just a quick little thing I do. When kids have a shirt that represents either science, technology, engineering, or math, I'll take a quick picture and put it on my digital picture frame, and it feeds through all the pictures that I have ever taken. So it's really fun when kids can see their past selves from a few years ago 
or they see their friends in another class and they actually have to guess how their shirt connects with science, technology, engineering, and math. And it's so cute too, because when the kids have STEM, they start wearing these shirts as well. And I have some of these shirts too. So it's just a really great talking point and also getting them to think about STEM in a different way. Also reaching out to parents can look a lot different in the specials role, but it still is important. One way that my teammates and I, the other specials teachers and I, reach out to parents is we do have a collaborative team newsletter. We just do a simple Google Slides and we share the link in our school newsletter and also in a different platform. But we have a Google Slides and then each slide is a different month of the year and we explain what we did throughout the month and have our contact information. This is a great way for us to work together as a team and be reflective on our work. And also, so parents know, we actually do some things in STEM that it is, yes, it's fun, but we do have really hard and exciting things that we're working on. Another way that I like to communicate with parents and also the students in my class is Seesaw. I could do a whole episode about Seesaw. I am literally obsessed. And also, if you haven't checked it out, go check out Seesaw Connect 2022, where I am talking about STEM Survival Camp and the engineering design process completely free, or you can watch it forever in my monthly membership. But I love using Seesaw because students are able to take pictures, videos, record audio of their work. They can comment on one another's work. I can comment. But also parents who are connected to their child's account can also see these amazing things that take place in our classroom and communicate as well. I've had a lot of parents chat with me on there and write comments and how excited their kid was to talk about their work. And now seeing a picture of it, they totally understand what the kid is trying to explain. Like I said, STEM has some really cool materials and sometimes it's kind of hard for kids to explain what they did in STEM. So having those visuals is really awesome. I do use Seesaw K through five. It is free for teachers and then your school could buy Seesaw for schools. But I highly recommend this tool because it is so interactive. You can accomplish a whole lot within this platform and really have that two-way communication and again, build those relationships. As you are continuing to build those relationships, you want to have a standard set of class rules for your STEM space. This is something that you're going to want to keep the same for K through five and keep them very simple. In episode seven, I shared with you some back to school STEM activities. And one of those is having a game review puzzle where kids are putting the pieces together of your classroom rules. So make sure to go check out that episode if you haven't listened yet. Have those main classroom rules that all the kids are used to when they come into your space and keep them very simple. At my school, we do something called Tiger Paws where classes can earn a paw for great behavior and they earn those from teachers, including specials teachers. So I have my four main rules as things that as a whole class, they do have to accomplish to earn their tiger paw. So you can check all of these out on the show notes for this episode. But the four main things that I make sure that all the class has accomplished is, did we finish today's work? Did we work together and try our best? Did we stay on task? And were we respectful of everyone's work? We go over these at the end of each day. And if it's a yes for all of those, then they get their class tiger paw. If it's a no, we will explain why. So kids will explain or I will explain why it's a no and what we can do better next time and tomorrow is a new day. If you want to, you can keep track of these tiger paws or class incentives and maybe they can earn a certain amount to do a class party. I've considered this idea. I honestly don't have enough time with the amount of time I have with kids, but if this is something that's interesting to you, definitely try it. I know other teachers have done this and it's been really successful in their rooms. Now, when you are teaching all the kids in the whole school, you're definitely going to have to modify some things for specific classes. You know this as a former classroom teacher. If you were one like me, Some classes really vibe together and some don't. (laughs) So you might need to have specific rules for specific classes. I even need to address things that go along with the classroom teacher's management style. Some classroom teachers are really strict and don't allow collaboration in their classroom. Some are 
really open-ended and that's a regular practice. So of course, definitely communicate with those classroom teachers. If you can chat with them really quick before it and at the end of class and see if there are any specific needs that you need to focus on for the day, any academic goals that you can help support with. Some classes might even have a class incentive that they're trying to work on. When I was a classroom teacher, I sent my kids with a grading sheet. So however they did in specials, the specials teacher could write that down on our sheet. And if they got an excellent, we got a class marble. And then this is where they could write down students who did an excellent job and students I needed to help support. So this was really helpful with the communication. If classroom teachers don't have this, you could definitely start this in your classroom to help bridge that communication gap. Also, if things aren't working, definitely ask that classroom teacher what you can do to help support the class. They might have a certain call to action that you can use with the kids, and that can be really helpful as well. And finally, for your last behavior management tip is that you want to have specific rules for specific materials. You have your whole class rules that we talked about. Those don't ever change. That is the same no matter what you're teaching. But then you have specific materials that you're going to be using throughout the year, and this is what you definitely want to change up. And this can also mean specific materials and which grade levels can use them as well. One example of different rules for materials in my classroom is the tables and chairs that students can sit at and how they actually know where they're going to be sitting. For all classes when they come into my room, they do come to that shared meeting area that we talked about in episode one. After that little mini lesson, and if I do want them sitting at the tables, I have a different set of rules for my K-1 students and for my second through fifth grade students. For K-1, I just have a bunch of colored Unifix cubes. I have six different colored cubes that match the colors I have on my six different tables. And there is about the same amount of cubes of each color. So there's four yellows, four orange, four green, and so on. When I'm ready for the kids to go to their tables, I'll randomly, randomly to them, in my head, I know exactly who I'm giving the cubes to. I give them a cube and they have to go find the matching color on their table. Now, if you're wondering how I put the colors on the table, it really isn't anything fancy. It is a page protector with a sheet of construction paper on the inside. On the flip side of that paper, I have about four sticky notes with numbers written on them and they're mixed up. Now the numbers are one through 27. I think I had one through 32 last year. Our third grade classes had 32 kids in each class. I have one through 32 written on sticky notes, one number per sticky note. And those are mixed up on the tables within that page protector. For my second and fifth grade students, when I'm ready for them to go to their tables, they go find their classroom number and sit at that spot, and then I can move kids based on who needs to be moved or whatever assistance they might need. This has worked really well in my classroom. There's less fighting. They know where to sit. Of course, for different projects, they might work on the floor or do other things, but sometimes I might need them at a specific spot for a specific reason. I also have specific rules for specific materials in my classroom. For example, when we're using robots, we will go over the rules and procedures for how to use that certain type of robot and how to handle it properly. Yes, again, we have those classroom rules, but we wanna take care when we're using those specific materials. So when I'm using Dash, we will go over how to hold Dash the robot, how to turn it on, how to connect to the app, how to work within our roles, all of those things are super important when we're working that with that specific material. For my hot glue guns, I will only use hot glue guns second through fifth grade, depending on how they're doing with projects. And again, we will go over those specific rules when we're using that tool in our classroom. As a recap, here are the three major points when you are building your behavior management strategies in your STEM space. Again, this is so important and you definitely want to take the time to get this set up properly in your classroom so you can do those awesome projects all year. First, of course, is to build those relationships. Next is to set up those class rules and goals. And third is to have the rules for specific materials. You can check out the links to all these, to specific lessons, the transcript for this video, and even the video version of this podcast. You might not have known that all up on the show notes, and you can find that using this link, naomimeredith.com slash episode eight. Thank you so much for joining me today, and I can't wait to talk to you in the next episode.